Our next topic is going to be cascades and fan outs. If you wanted to subtitle this, what's more fun than studying a transmission line in a circuit? Studying two transmission lines in a circuit. Or more. And so cascades and fan outs are, are circuits that have two or more transmission lines in them. And don't get too scared in this class because really we're just going to emphasize a couple of basic fundamentals of networks with multiple transmission lines. I'm not going to have you ever tra uh, work out on a test the transient voltage as a function of time for two or more transmission lines connected in series or parallel or whatever. This it just gets ridiculous. Uh, that's what computers are for. We need to understand the concepts and the fundamentals. So we can check the computer and make sure it makes logical sense in the limiting cases. But for the most part, there comes a point where these problems, you've got so many transmission lines connected to one another, voltages reflecting and transmitting and, and ringing again and again and again, back and forth on all the different lines, that it just becomes an untenable problem without a computer. However, we're going to at least learn how to set up those problems, right? So let's talk, first start talking about the cascade. Let's say that you have a 50 ohm transmission line and you have connected it immediately to a 75 ohm transmission line. Let's put a 50 ohm resistor here and let's say hypothetically that it's in a 50 ohm source. So under what scenario might this happen? Well, the one that I've drawn here with the numbers, this could be, for example, a 50 ohm coaxial cable that you thought was matched because you connected, wanted a, an extender cable matched to a 50 ohm load, but you accidentally picked up a 75 ohm cable. Why would that happen? Well, it turns out like in, in coaxial cables, there are several different standards of impedance that they use. 50 ohms is usually used for high UHF and microwave frequencies. Um, and uh, 75 ohms is typically used in uh, lower frequency, long distance cable TV applications. The black cable that comes in from the cable TV manufacturer into your home is usually a 75 ohm cable. That cable that I passed around, uh, that expensive one that I did microwave measurements with that I passed around earlier in the class last week, that has a 50 ohm cable. Why would you prefer one over the other? <coughs> Why would some people use one standard and one other people use another standard? Well, it wouldn't necessarily be velocity, but there is something. Let, let's, let's head down this path. Let's say I'm, at the end of the day, the showstopper in communications is always power. It turns out that no matter uh, what fancy signal processing you do, if you can't get a minimum amount of power or signal-to-noise ratio at the end of your cable, you can, you'll never be able to get so many bits per second. There's a famous theorem in communication theory, theory called the Shannon Channel Capacity Theorem, which basically says your signal, if for a given signal-to-noise ratio, you can never get reliable communications over so many bits per second in a given bandwidth. So, really, power is the showstopper in communications. That's the lesson to take, take home from that. And let's say I had the same amount of power on a, trans, on a transmission line that was 75 ohms. Remember, power is going to be equal, let's call it power plus, is going to be equal to V plus times I plus. Which I could also write as V plus squared over Z naught. Or conversely, I plus squared times Z naught. Okay, so 
for the same amount of power, let's say I had a power on 75 ohm lines, one watt, and then that same watt of power on the 50 ohm lines, which one of those is going to have a bigger current to carry the same amount of power, based on this simple expression here? The 75 ohm or the 50 ohm? Fifty ohm. Some people say I hear seventy-five. I hear fifty. 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 Fifty ohm. So remember, this is the ratio of V plus to I plus. If the product stays constant, then clearly in the fifty ohm, the current's going to be a little bit higher, right? Is that true? So we're saying that power is fixed for a fixed amount of power. So let's let's do it. Let's rewrite it this way so it's a little clearer. V plus squared is equal to Z naught times P plus. I plus squared is equal to P plus divided by Z naught. So if Z naught increases, my voltage gets bigger and my current drops for the same amount of power that I transmit through the line. As my impedance get, gets bigger, voltage increases, current drops. So long distance cables, like your, uh, you know, the, the several hundred meters of length that you run from your last stage of your cable company's amplifier to your home, you want to use 75 ohms. And the reason for that is that, remember, we're dealing with lossless transmission lines, but in truth, never, nothing is ever quite lossless. There are going to be some conductor losses that accumulate over long cable runs. And so, if you've got a smaller current traveling your transmission line in both directions, Remember that ohmic losses are going to be I squared times the series resistance on the top and the bottom bar, which do accumulate over time. So the smaller currents will result, because especially since it's a square term, will result in less ohmic loss on this line. And you'll get more power out at the end for the same given input power here. Now. The nice thing, that's the nice thing about 75 ohms. 50 ohms, why might you want to use that? Well, remember our expression for a coaxial cable? This is going to be a more capacitive transmission line, a less inductive, which means you can make the outer sheathing smaller and use less material. So for short runs, this is an, a... a cheaper, easier to work with cable. Uh, it also turns out to be really well suited for uh, microwave frequencies in terms of the dielectrics that you can use to get 50 ohms in that geometry. And so that's why there are kind of two different standards. You know, it depends on what a uh, application you're emphasizing. So in this particular scenario, I've got a 50 ohm cascaded uh, with a 75 ohm transmission line, what is going to go on at the junction of this circuit? That's a mismatch, right? I got a device here that looks like a 75 ohm resistor when it's uh, uncharged. So if I send a wave on here and it travels down, I'm going to see a mismatch just as if it was a 75 ohm resistor. So my gamma going from line 1 to 2 I'm going to going from 1 to 2 is going to be equal to 75 minus 50 over 75 plus 50 or 1 fifth if you do the math and simplify. 
So my waveform comes down. If this is a DC switch signal, it comes down. It reflects. A fifth of the voltage is going to jump onto here and start traveling down. A portion of this is going to reflect back until it sees this matched source. Now, some of that waveform makes it down to the end. Clearly, this junction is mismatched. A portion of that will reflect back. What reflection coefficient does the uh, 50 ohm line present to the 75 ohm transmission line? This would be gamma 2 to 1. Well, I've got 50 as my load at that point. 75 ohm is the intrinsic impedance of the line, so I put 50 minus 75 over 50 plus 75. Lo and behold, minus 1 fifth. Or really just minus my gamma 1, 2. So in both directions, the circuit is mismatched. I just have to recognize that the, the voltage reflection coefficient just changes polarity depending on which side that I'm approaching it at. Pretty straightforward, right? Any questions so far? I think I have 30 seconds until the bell rings, so we will do the fan out reflection coefficient. We have multiple lines on the output of a transmission line uh, at the start of Tuesday's class next week. See you then. Have a good weekend. Okay. Well, that, in that case, let's finish up our discussion on cascades and and fan outs. Uh, we were talking about slightly more complicated. Uh, transmission line networks where you had more than one transmission line in your circuit model. And this is a very common. The, the cascade is whenever you put two different transmission lines together, connect them at the ports, and they have different electrical properties, specifically different, different impedances. We learned last time that if you had a scenario like this where you had a transmission line with impedance number one and impedance number two, if these impedances were not the same, then there would be a mismatch at the junction. And lo and behold, you get a, a reflection coefficient looking into here this way. Let's put it subscript 1 to denote that. That was Z2 minus Z1 over Z2 plus Z1. And this would also be equal to minus the reflection coefficient that you would see going this way. So um, that, that's the simplest, most uh, two transmission line network we could dream up. It's relatively straightforward. We're just using the same load formulas to demarcate the reflection coefficient at that point. And this is a, a cascade because you're cascading the transmission lines. Our next topic that we're going to start to talk about is a fan out. And this is where things get topologically a little tricky. Oh, yes, you have a question? Yeah. Say in that, in that case, if you wanted to include, say, maybe a third transmission line, yeah. would, would the reflection coefficient be, um, say, Z3 minus Z1 plus Z2? Well, no. If, like, do you continue the ones previous as a single? Like, yeah, how do you do? that's a great question. What happens when there's a third transmission line here? call it a Z3 with a separate impedance. And again, you follow the same methodology. At this junction, the, the reflection is going to be our whatever's on the load, which is Z3 minus Z2 over Z3 plus Z2. And then you flip the sign if you're looking at this way. So you just keep, kind of repeat this methodology. What's going on over here does not immediately re affect the reflection coefficient at that junction. They're calculated just with the thing immediately to the right and to the left of the junction. Now that's not to say that what's going on over here won't influence over here. When you go to actually do an analysis of this thing, and this is where it gets kind of complicated, you launch a wave, like a pulse, for example, down this line, you're going to get reflections and transmissions at this junction that's mismatched. 
And that reflection and transmission is going to go down here, you're going to get a reflection off here, and you're going to get the same thing. And then that reflection is going to come back to here, you're going to get the same thing. That reflection is going to come off this junction, going to come back here, you're going to get a split here, and a transmission and a reflection here, and it goes on and on and on, and it becomes very difficult to keep track, and that's what computers are for. Yeah. What in particular would be the most important thing to pay attention to regarding the transmission lines if you want to make sure that the gain was the same? Uh, it, what would be the most important thing to make sure you didn't lose? Yeah, you want to have a consistent gain. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so generally speaking, the losses are bad. So you either change the geometry to match the impedances. But if you can't do that, then this analysis will at least tell you where the problem junctions are going to be. I, I'm going to get to, uh, maybe by the end of this lecture or in the next lecture, um, we're going to talk about short pulses on transmission lines. And for the simple case, we'll, so, we'll show how to actually trace out the short pulses on the line. And that will give us basically a channel impulse response. So we're going to turn into a little bit of a DSP course, uh, or a signal processing course, uh, for a little bit and show you how that's going to affect the signal. You can use some of the same things that you learned in 2025 to analyze that system. Yeah, what's your question? So whenever it's the intersection between Z1 and Z2, what is the waveform that is now traveling through Z2? Well, remember, it's always the same shaped waveform. The question is, what does a waveform look like when it hits this junction? In the case of these switch DC pulses, like logic pulses that we've been looking at, logic pulse will come down, strike the junction, and it will be sort of the leading edge of the step function that propagates in both directions. So it'll still look like a switch DC source. In this case, it'll be riding, behind, riding on top of whatever's there. And in this case, it'll be a new pulse that launches down the uncharged line at the first strike. That's right. When we get when we get to short pulses, if we're sending like a, just a little rectangle function or a triangle pulse or something like that, you'll find it's the exact same thing. The triangle pulse transmits to this side. Part of it's reflected down this side, and it preserves the shape because generally. Unless, these are, unless you get a lossy transmission line, these type lossless transmission lines do not distort the shape of the waveform on them. Although the lossy lines will add sort of an exponential decay to the amplitude, so it'll kind of warp it over time. Yeah? I have a question. Is it possible to combine Z1 and Z2 like uh, resistors in series? So like to make an oh, equation yeah, for yeah. Z3 equal to like Z2 plus Z1, like the impedance at that junction equal to Z2 plus Z1? Oh, this is a really good question. So he says, is there a question? Can you make like a feminine equivalent for this complicated system? And right now, we're tracking sort of broadband behavior of these transmission lines. We're looking at broadband pulses or leading edges of DC pulses. Remember, those are very broadband phenomena. You remember, do you ever take like the, the Laplace transform or the Fourier transform of a square pulse in something that looks like a unit step function, basically, or a square function? You know, it has a lot of, lot of frequency content at high frequencies. So you've got to have all of that behavior modeled. We're going to spend a couple lectures, once we're done with time domain transmission lines, with time harmonic transmission lines. That is, uh, transmission lines that have steady state sinusoids on them, because that's very useful for looking at things like RF signals. Um, even some fiber optic cables can be m m uh, modeled with those types of uh, systems. And what you're going to find there, when we kind of look at one frequency behavior, we're going to use phasers, just like you did in your time harmonic circuits class. And then you can actually come up with uh, a frequency feminine equivalent. Like, I'll put a load here, and you can actually transform that. I'll give you a system of equations that will let you transform that to a feminine equivalent at any arbitrary point on any arbitrary number of not lines. And it's very interesting, because what can happen in, in that scenario is uh, you, you will actually stick something that's, say, purely resistive on the end of your line, and, like say it was 10 ohms, and if you transform it to a certain resonant point on the line, you can make it look like 50 plus J70 ohms, kind of inductive. Or you can look, make it look like 10 minus J90 ohms, kind of like a capacitive load. In fact, you can take an open circuit and change it into any value of inductance or capacitance that you want. 
take something out of thin air and make a reactive component. You can only do that at these high frequencies, but it's a very interesting phenomenon. It's something you can take advantage of as a circuit designer. But we haven't gotten there yet. Good questions. Yeah. Um, just to add to the previous question, if there's no um, impedance mismatch, can we add that as a series? Um, ah, like could, could you, if these were the same impedance lines, could you do something at this junction to intentionally introduce a mismatch? No. If oh. There is no mismatch. If there is no mismatch, <laughs> Z1 is equal to Z2. Right. Can you just add them? Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. So the, at that point, the reflection coefficient would be zero. And if these had roughly the same velocity of propagations, this line and that line, you might as well just model them as one long transmission line. If you were really into like modeling the latency of waveforms on these lines, and these had were maybe two different geometry of transmission lines, but they happen to have the same impedance, then this, they might have different velocities of propagation. And so when you trace that waveform down, you just have to be mindful that it would be moving at different velocities on different lengths. And that might be a phenomenon that you're trying to track in your system, trying to coordinate logic gates or something like that. Any other questions? I have some, one more. No? Oh, yeah. Um, there's a gamma's uh, That's right. And that's right. Not everything that exists I write on the board. I, I did write it for this junction, though. I put minus, minus gamma sub 2. Oh, yeah, yeah, so for cascaded lines, the reflection coefficient this way is always just negative the reflection coefficient this way. Because you're using the same equation, right? It's kind of like the same problem. I got a transmission line on this side of the junction, I got a transmission line on this side of the junction. The only thing that b difference is my feed line becomes my load line when I switch. So that means that this, these terms switch up at the top, and that's why it's negative. So it's a handy handy point to, to consider when you're trying to do these calculations on a test. Okay, so let's go back to, to uh, fan outs. And now we're going to introduce a third transmission line. Like, why on earth would you want to do that? Well, this happens quite a bit. Let's say you want to split your signal line and send the output to two different devices on a printed circuit board, for example. Splitting a signal is a very common function. And when you do that, you essentially introduce a junction that has three transmission lines. And so the one that I'm going to show you first we'll call a parallel fan out. So that's where I've got a transmission line feeding another transmission line. And then I'm going to pick off, I'm going to put a dot there that denotes an electrical connection. I'm going to put a little hop there that denotes uh, a crossing in your wiring diagram but not a, an electrical connection. <clears throat> and I've got this second uh, Actually, a third transmission line. And we can see, we call it a parallel because the terminals of the input of this transmission line are in parallel electrically when they're connected to this transmission line. It can, tends to be a little bit of a topological brain teaser in your head, especially when you see these implemented on a circuit board, for example. But let's say for the sake of argument that we even managed to make all the trace widths on our microstrip PCB the same width so that everything has the same impedance. Even if everything has the same impedance, when you put devices in parallel with one another, you still make a mismatch. Because what does this end of the transmission line see? Well, effectively the load is now the Z0 intrinsic impedance of this line in parallel with the Z0 intrinsic impedance of this line, which is what value? Z0 over, over 2, right? Two identical resistors in parallel with one another is always half the value. So I got a Z0 over 2 as my load, and I use the same formula. That's my load. I subtract the intrinsic impedance on this side, 
I add them in the denominator, and that's my reflection coefficient. What does that evaluate to? Well, I got z naught over 2 minus z naught. That's z naught over a half with a negative sign in front of it. And this is 3 z naught over a half. So I get the reflection coefficient when the z naughts cancel of negative one third. So even though the individual lines are matched, when you connect them in series fan out to split the signal, you intrinsically keep, you, you intrinsically make a mismatch. So you have to be careful with that. Here's a question. What is that reflection coefficient? Let's call this reflection coefficient number one because it's in line number one. We'll call this reflection coefficient number two. And we'll call this junction re reflection coefficient number three. What is reflection coefficient number three? Any brave volunteers? What? One sixth. One sixth. How did you figure that? So here's the junction. If I feed a signal from this direction, I got a z-naught transmission line. What does it see? Uh, You're close. That's right. It sees a z-naught in parallel with z-naught. So I actually have the same reflection coefficient here. And if I looked at the reflection coefficient at this junction, at the end of the line, a signal propagating down here, we'll see a load that consists of the z-naught in parallel with the z-naught. So it doesn't matter. Which, uh, which side I approach this junction from, I get the same reflection coefficient. Yeah? Um, can you explain again why it's z-naught over 2? Well, because I've got z-naught, let's say I'm coming down here, I see z-naught in parallel with another z-naught. So if I use my parallel formula, 1 over 1 over z-naught plus 1 over 1 over z-naught, I get z naught over 2 as my load, basically. Then I plug it into my standard equation. Yes, Lem? Are you trying to say that those three are like a um, three way parallel? Like, like, usually I see it like almost like, a, like maybe like the inner crossings of like, like a triangle inside. I, I don't know how to say it. Well, it's a, it, it's a, a transmission line is a two port device. And when all three when each port of one of those lines, all three of those lines are connected in parallel, there is a symmetry to the situation, right? No matter which direction I feed the signal down side, uh, uh, which line I feed the signal down, I always see two lines in parallel at the terminus with identical impedances in the uh, circuit diagram that I drew. Yeah, I'm just kind of confused with the way you do it. Kind of, I'm trying to do this, yeah, yeah. Like this. No, no. This, this is very much a top a topology exercise, like trying to train the mind to see the circuit topology. Because things get kind of complicated when you have to draw humps and stuff. Let, let me ask you a question. If I wanted to match this junction, like say this was the output of a logic gate, and I wanted to feed two other chips on my circuit board. What values of impedance should I make this with respect to z naught in order to get a match? 2 z naught. If I put 2 z naught here, 2 z naught here, parallel combination of z naught, the junction is matched and I'm not wasting any power with reflections. Conversely, I could make this z naught over 2 and just leave these as z naught. That again would match the junction and I would not waste any uh, signal power with reflections. So let's look at the case. Now let's translate this into the real world. Let's say I had a PCB with microstrip uh, transmission line traces. And I'm going to put a ground plane on this side of the printed circuit board. And here's my Junction. So this is the, basically the top bar of transmission line one. The bottom bar is the ground plane. That's where the return currents propagate and the voltage difference is measured against. It hits this junction. I've got a trace this way and a trace this way. If I, in either matching scenario, my line here is going to have to have uh, half the impedance of these individual lines, right? 
In other words, this line has to have double the impedance so that when it's parallel, uh, combined in parallel with this trace that has double the impedance, you'll get the original Z0 that matches this junction perfectly. So if I'm trying to match this junction perfectly, I got two Z0 here, two Z0 here. Does that mean that this, what does that mean with respect to the width of these traces? Will this be fatter or skinnier than the original feed line? Let's see. How many people say fatter? Raise your hand. Okay, we have zero volt votes. Good, good. Oh, one, one vote, two vote, two votes, three votes. Good, good. Three votes. How many people say skinnier? These will have to be skinnier to match that junction. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine votes. So it's nine to three with like 40 abstaining. Okay. Okay, let's, let's, let's see. We said that this is going to be half the size or half the impedance of that. And remember, impedance is square root of L over C, the per unit length inductance over the per unit length capacitance. This Z0 needs to be smaller than this Z0, which means it needs to be less inductive and or, and or more capacitive. So for the same thickness printed circuit board with the same dielectric materials, how do you make something more capacitive? You broaden it. This is like a parallel plate capacitor, right? Parallel plate capacitor has a per unit length capacitance that's, you know, gets bigger as you make the thing wider on a printed circuit board. Just because it's a per unit length doesn't mean it doesn't follow the same rules as your your parallel plate capacitor or any other capacitor that you studied in physics class. So we are trying to make Z naught, the, these two, two trace lines, twice the value of Z naught. In other words, we want this transmission line to have less impedance than this transmission line. In order to do that, we can raise the capacitance, lower the inductance, and you do that by widening the trace, making this dimension wider. That makes it more capacitive, less inductive, and you'll match that junction. So you can then send, send signals down without reflections and wasted power. So if you looked at this, if you ever see, you can you can see. Uh, Circuit designers, when they do this, take a printed circuit board that has a high frequency trace on it, and if you look at the top of it, you should see something like this when they're trying to make a T junction that's matched, a parallel fan out. Here's your wider low impedance trace. It's matched with two higher impedance traces that, when they're in parallel, has the same value Z naught of this circuit trace. Does everybody understand the circuit topology that I etched up there? This remarkable three-dimensional rendering with computer-like precision? Is that helpful? <laughs> well, that, that's a common uh, topology, the parallel fan out. Now, if you can do parallel, you can also do series, right? So let me draw that electrically. Let's say now, for the sake of argument, you had your three transmission lines, Z0. First line is Z0. You send a signal down here. And then you have a second Z0 transmission line. This is the series fan out. And notice how this is differently connected. In this case, you can see that what I see at the output of this terminal are two terminals connected in series. 
And so my load is really Z naught plus Z naught or two Z naught. Not half the Z naught like the parallel case. And what is the reflection coefficient going to be at that point? Well, I calculated just like I calculate everything else. Reflection at junction one is going to be my load two Z naught minus my Z naught feeder line. And then I add them in the denominator, just like any other reflection coefficient, and I get positive one third. Huh, look at that. It's the same reflection coefficient as the parallel case, I just flipped the sign. Interesting. And in fact, you see that same reflection coefficient no matter which of these junctions you look into. Isn't that interesting too? You want to look at this junction? I got Z naught in series electrically with another Z naught. My load's going to be 2 Z naught. Reflection coefficient's going to be the same thing. Gamma sub 3 will also be equal to gamma sub 2, whether I look at it this way or this way. Now the question is, how do you fan stuff out? Like what? What determines whether you use a series or a, a parallel fan out on your circuit board or in your electrical connectivity? And it all really depends on um, the topology that you're working with. If you're working with microstrip lines, I don't know if you can visually see that from the diagram that I drew, but if you want to do a series connection of multiple traces, You've got to drill some vias and do some acrobatics on your boards in order to get that topology to connect. It's much easier to do a parallel fan out because you just connect traces on the top layer. Conversely, if you didn't have a ground plane and you were just using a pair, a pair of traces to carry the transmission line, what we would call coplanar strip, tr uh, strip, two traces on top of a PCB, then it's easier to route with series series fan outs. So let's see, I think you had your hand up first. Um, I'm just kind of confused how they like, how do they interact? Do they interact with the like fields in between each other? Yeah, so so how do the what's physically going on here? The question is uh, when the voltage waveform, the E fields between these things, which is are effectively what a voltage drop between two pieces of metal are, when that waveform hits the junction here, well, now I've got a voltage across both of these at the same time. And if they're identical impedances, half of it's going to be here, half of it's going to be here. And that'll launch a waveform here, but there'll be a mismatch. In order to launch those waveforms, that voltage drop on the top and the bottom bar, I'm going to need a certain amount of current. So the, the effective impedance of the load, the ratio of voltage to current, is going to be different than the feeding impedance from my line which means in order to support that amount of voltage and current, I need to spawn a reflection. And that's what my reflection coefficient tells me. I need to make a reflection to meet the boundary condition of this quirky series fan out. If they're in parallel, then that voltage hits at the same time, and I get the same voltage across each of these, but it's the current that splits. Here it's the same current that's going through the, the junctions when there's a waveform striking the end. When they're in parallel, it's the same voltage. Let's see, yeah, do you have? Um, I know there is an intrinsic mismatch over there. What if the impedance values were different? Oh, yeah. How does it fan out? It would be the opposite of the parallel case, right? If we wanted to fan out without a reflection here, we could design the geometry of these two lines so that they were Z naught over two a piece. When you added them in series, you'd have a Z naught load impedance, which would present with zero reflection coefficient at this junction. What if it's for higher Z like three Z Ah, if it was three Z naught, pretty easy to calculate. Three Z naught here, in series with three Z naught here, that would give me a total load impedance of six Z naught. Subtract Z naught over the summation of the two. I would get a reflection coefficient in this case of positive five sevenths. Almost, almost two thir over two thirds of the wave would reflect back at that junction. That would be severely mismatched. Any other questions about 
fan outs and cascades before we move on to the next topic. Okay.